Hey, garden nerds, we have a sponsor for this episode. True Leaf Market has been a supplier of exclusively non-GMO seeds since 1974. They offer a wide selection of seeds, many of which are heirloom and organic, for everything from vegetables to flowers, grains to herbs, and specialty seeds. And when I say specialty, I'm referring to their huge selection of seeds and growing supplies for sprouting and microgreens. So if you're into either of those two things, this is definitely the store for you. Their seed packets are affordable and are available in sizes for the home gardener all the way up to bulk wholesale. Visit trueleafmarket.com and use our promo code GTOTW50, that's for Garden Nerd Tip of the Week, five zero, and you'll get a discount. Now, on with the show. Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where garden nerds from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. This week, we're chatting with Lois DeVries. She's the executive director of the Sustainable Gardening Institute and Library. Her work has earned her the Jefferson Presidential Award for nearly a decade of service in environmental advocacy. She joins me today to share how we can use the library for research and to become better gardeners, farmers, and stewards of the planet. Welcome to the podcast, Lois. Thanks so much, Christy. It's great to be here. Well, we know each other through the Sustainability Committee at GardenCom, which was formerly known as Garden Writers Association. And it's a, a group of writers and creators who strive to keep environmentalism or sustainability present in all aspects of what we do. You even won a Green Medal Award for Sustainability from GardenCom in 2019, which is a great honor. And our members hail from all around the country. So you're across the country from me. Tell us a little bit about where you are and what your garden is doing these days. Well, I'm based in northwestern corner of New Jersey, right where New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey come together. If people are familiar with the area, it would be just south of the High Point region. And we basically have a four acre woodland and towering 90 plus year old trees. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> we garden about one acre of the four acres and leave the rest to nature. Um, I've lived here for about 45 years continuously and parents had a summer cabin here before that. That's basically, you know, we expanded it over the years and, and winterized it and here I am. So during that time, we've seen a lot of changes. This was originally a dairy farm area. So at one time there were more cows than people. That's kind of changed over the years and we're semi-rural now and it's starting to migrate into, you know, the farms have become housing developments basically. And I used to live on a dirt road, but now it's a county highway. So Lots and lots of changes, but uh, lots of changes in the garden too. So that's given my long-term residence has given me the opportunity to see or observe how gardens evolve over time. And when I was a little kid, I used to run around picking wild strawberries all over the place. Obviously they can't grow in the woods, so <laughs> no more strawberries. We're plagued now with invasive plants and invasive insects. Yeah, I don't know how bad it is in California, but you know, it's kind of be careful what you wish for. Um, <laughs> the ground cover in the forest was primarily Virginia creeper, which some people don't like it, but it kept the weeds out. And you know, it's a combination of too many deer, Virginia creeper. And that allowed some invasives to come in. So we were plagued with garlic mustard. Oh. Which is, you know, the pilgrims or whoever brought that over, you know, from Europe early on. And it just, you know, completely took over from the native plants. So we, we decided we were going to fight this. And it's a biennial. So... Um, if you can keep it from seeding, eventually you can wear the seed bank down. 
So we did that. We were religious about, you know, weed whacking two, three, four times a summer to keep the garlic mustard from seeding. And so instead of garlic mustard, we ended up with Japanese stilt grass. Is that another invasive? It's another invasive, but it's worse than the garlic mustard. Oh, no. <laughs> so it, it's one of those grasses that it gets tall. And then when it falls over, the nodes root wherever it touches the ground. It. It's a so, walking weed. Lovely. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> so so uh, we're battling Japanese stilt grass now and oriental bittersweet ground ivy and creeping charlie or ground ivy is creeping charlie but uh yeah so those are our invasive plants and some of your listeners might be familiar with the problems with emerald ash borers and spotted lantern fly yeah so yeah dealing with that too the animal life has changed over time as well from, uh, we had a, used to have a lot of insect eating birds like fly, fly catchers and warblers. And now we primarily have seed eaters. So that's my story. Okay, <laughs> so you have, you have nature encroaching in a not totally balanced way in your wildlife, I guess is what's, what's happening over there. Invasive species have taken hold and I'm jumping the gun by asking like how, besides the weed whacking is there anything your community is doing to try and fight them back? Uh that would be a hard no I think. Um mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to get people to understand what needs to happen without, you know, uh and a, and I'm, I have a story for you later on about, you know, be careful what you spray. Mm -hmm. And that that seems to be everybody's, you know, knee jerk reaction to bad, you know, spray it, kill it, kill it, spray it, you know, with poison. Um, people did understand about the spotted lantern fly, so I think, you know, homeowners are becoming, even apartment dwellers are becoming more aware than in past years but people here are still planting invasive things like butterfly bush because mm -hmm. it's pretty and it attracts pollinators. But here in New Jersey, it's invasive and you really shouldn't be planting it. So, and nor should the nurseries be selling it. No, it's such a big problem when the nurseries are selling things that are invasive. We have the same problem out here with Mexican feather grass and fountain grass. They're both horribly invasive and the nurseries are still carrying them. It shouldn't happen. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with one of our collaborators there in California, Plant Right. Plant Right? Plant Right. I think they're up near Sacramento. Okay. And they publish a list of California invasives in California and they're working towards getting the state and the counties to prohibit selling those types of plants. And, you know, that that's, that's not helpful to homeowners unless you give them an alternative. So they do that as well. Yeah, it's true. And unfortunately, landscape designers in our area don't seem to be on that page either. And so they're, they're designing it into the landscapes for a lot of the modern homes that are going in. So it's tricky because you have to work on both fronts. You have to get the intelligence to the, not just the vendors, but to the designers as well. So what we're talking about is all of this knowledge that needs to be available to more people, which segues perfectly into my next question about the Sustainability Gardening Institute and Library. How did it come about? Well, you might be aware, if you can remember back that far, that this was a project that started with then Garden Writers Sustainability Committee, and it, it came about because, you know, the committee members were writing articles that needed to be vetted, and we had two very excellent editors, David Ellis from American Gardener Magazine, he's the editor there, and Anne-Marie Van Nest from Canada. And 
what was happening was that we were finding no really good authoritative information about the topics that our committee members were writing about. What we did find was that people were copying and pasting from one another's blogs mm -hmm. with no you know, evidence or science behind what they were saying and just repeating what one another were saying. And so there was no one single place that you could go to look up these different topics on sustainability. And honestly, one morning I just woke up and said, what we need is a sustainable gardening library. So that's kind of how it started. What I was after was gathering information from authoritative sources. Otherwise, you don't know how much the person that you're, whose material you're reading, how much do they actually know? You know, are they a hobbyist gardener and, you know, don't really know what they're talking about? Or is it some professor at a university? Just if you're reading a blog or watching a YouTube, you just don't really know unless they tell you. And our idea was we did a survey of garden writers members and asked them who they felt we gave them a list to check off who they felt were the top three authoritative resources for this kind of information and it came out as i i hoped it would which was public gardens and arborita and other you know similar nonprofits, colleges and universities and this prize for me at the time was government agencies because i, I really wasn't too sure what people thought about you know the usda and organizations like that so those are our primary suppliers of information in the farming side we do have for example practical farmers of iowa and other farming groups like that that are you know their experience is more hands-on but they have lots of great information they do a lot of experiments and open farm days where they exchange information so you know we, we have a, a wide variety of organizations contributing information and they're all over the united states we like to say from maine to florida and maine to hawaii so uh, we have collaborators in hawaii and in alaska as well so what kind of resources can people expect to find when they visit the library we have a wide variety of collaborators, and we decided who would contribute the information by taking a survey back at when we were with uh, garden writers. And the top three authoritative resources that our members named were public gardens and arborita, colleges and universities. And I was surprised at the time government agencies, because back then we we're, were talking like 2012, 2013, somewhere around there, people had a little bit of a jaundiced view, for example, the USDA, but they've come around to being more sustainable. And they also have a really good resource for uh, identifying where invasive species or plant species or for example so we like to say we're you know uh we've got collaborators from maine to florida and maine to hawaii so we don't have content providers in all 50 states but uh we do have alaska and hawaii so the reading level you know you can find lesson plans in there for say middle schoolers on through college and up through adults some of it would be you know kind of nerdy <laughs> and more interesting to people that are really trying to do research but we also have uh information for the homeowner so some collaborators in connecticut uh, have a home and garden section where they have contributed a lot of information just for the home gardener and here in new jersey uh, we have an organization barnegat bay a partnership which is which is a consortium actually and covers for example native plants all across New Jersey 
and in different ecosystems because New Jersey's got everything. We've got the mountains and we've got the seashore too. So very different plant life and plant care needed in those different types of environments. Mm -hmm. What's the best way for people to use the library to find information for their region? Because you said it's kind of coast to coast. What do you suggest for people to do? How do you want people to approach the library? Well, it kind of depends what their interests are. So um, we have three primary apps on the home page. One is topics, one is organizations, and the other one is eco regions, which I guess we'll talk about later. The topics is kind of like the old, you know, library card catalog where you look up by subject. Uh, we have more than 40 different topic areas. So beneficial insects, compost, sustainable landscape practices, stormwater management, native plants, meadows, you know, just different topics on sustainable gardening. Mm -hmm. And when people click on one of those topic areas, a map opens for them that shows them by a map pin where the different locations of the various collaborators are who have content on that subject in the library. So if you were looking at native plants or pollinators, you know, you click on, you know, the bee symbol or the milkweed symbol and a map will open up with map pins on it and you just look in your area. But what we feel was that, you know, something extra that we provide is that superimposed on the map of the United States is the USDA hardiness zone map. And so folks can look at content providers in areas that are not right where they are, but say in the next state or two states away, but that are in the same hardiness zone and find out what plants may also grow in their area that maybe are not that popular in their area, but are being highlighted in an adjacent zone area. So I know that sounds a little complicated, but it's basic. It's, it's basically visual. That, yeah. that people can, can look at any content provider in their same hardiness zone and get information that's suitable to their hardiness zone. And can you define the difference between, because you mentioned eco-regions. So what's what's the difference between hardiness zone and eco-regions if someone wanted to look at, into eco-regions? Well, as you know, Christy, uh, the uh, hardiness zones are based on temperature, which, uh, you know, on top of everything else that's fluctuating in our, our <laughs> Drastically. climate. Yeah. But that's not the whole story with plants. So, you know, I live in an area where uh, I'm in zone 5B, but I have acid soil conditions and heavy clay. Mm. Someone in another section of zone 5B may have alkaline soils and they may be very um, much more sandy than what I have here. So the same plants would not grow well in both of those region, eco regions. So that's the extra information. So the eco regions is a map that's supplied by the EPA. They have 200 and some odd eco regions across North America that, that includes Canada. And this will give you a quick reference to soils, climate, native vegetation, hydrology, terrain, wildlife. And, you know, here in the East, we would consider very important previous land use. Oh, uh, interesting. Which might include brownfields. So, um, you know, you you want to know what's under the ground before you start digging a big hole. So Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the, the Eco Regions app has both of those maps toggled together in one application. So you can look at them separately or together. 
what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you zoom in on your hometown, you'll get both the, uh, uh, you'll get a pop up when you click on, on a point on the map. So it's interactive, it's scalable. And when you click on a point, say the name of your town, a pop up opens that tells you both your hardiness zone and outlines the features of the eco region that you're in. And why is this important? <laughs> well, some towns may have three or four eco regions in the same geographic area of the town, even a small town. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have a mountain range running through or a river running through your your city, you may have more than one eco region there. And so this map has layers that you can toggle on and off. Is that right? Correct. Okay. What are your favorite bits of information that you refer to, you find yourself referring to most often on the site? Well, that varies according to what I'm what I'm doing. I I tend to look uh, up information about invasive species, mm -hmm. uh, as we discussed <laughs> earlier. Like, what am I going to do about this? And I. I may not find what I want exactly in the library, but then I find a collaborator who will have more information on that topic and I can go directly from the library to their website. So we do have, you know, contact information for the collaborators. Uh, they all appoint a contact person, you know, who are you going to call? So their phone number and their email is in the pop-up. That's great. This is a wonderful resource for people who are doing research for their dissertation, or if they're writing articles for newspapers and magazines, or if they're students who are just trying to learn more about gardening or farming or their ecosystem and how to be more sustainable. Yeah, I mean, we, th we think it's the best thing since sliced bread, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> So are there any plans for expansion of the library? Well, the big idea uh, when we first started was that we wanted it to be international. And I, you know, I've been trying and trying to get some gardens across the border in Canada. And so far, you know, we've had a few bites, but they haven't come to fruition yet. So if anybody's listening in the UK or Australia or somewhere else across the globe, you know, get in touch with us. We'd love to talk to you about becoming a collaborator and supplying information in the library. And I think it's challenging too, because we don't, the whole globe doesn't use the same system. For example, hardiness zones are different in the UK than they are here. And there needs to be some sort of collaboration on that end too. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> when you nerd out on GIS maps, you discover that there are hardiness maps for all over the world, probably not every single country, but there certainly are for the uh, UK and Australia. Um, and they're they're analogous. I haven't looked into it that deeply to see if they're exact parallels, but yeah, somebody's done that. <laughs> okay, good to know. All right, we just need it all in one place then. All right, it is tip time. Do you have a favorite tip you'd like to share with the Garden Nerd audience? Yes, I do. And it comes from personal experience. Think before you spray, because what you spray in the garden doesn't stay in your garden. And my personal experience with this, and I have to say, I'm normally a pretty careful person when it comes to, you know, pesticides, herbicides. I only use them as an absolute last resort. And I can say I probably haven't sprayed anything for the last 10 years at least. And this is also a cautionary tale of what can happen when you buy a plant in a nursery. Um, I, I have this you know container plant that I plant up exactly the same way every year because I just like how it looks. It's calico geranium. And I usually underplant it with licorice plants. And this one year, I I got this great, huge licorice plant. I brought it home, set it in, in you know, its place, and it looked great. 
a few days later, I was like, oh my God, what's happening? The leaves are disappearing. You know, I can't believe, you know, what kind of bug is on here? I, they have fuzzy leaves. So I was like, nobody eats fuzzy leaves. I kept an eye on it and it just, it got to the point where I thought, oh my God, this plant is just going to croak. And I started to see tiny, tiny caterpillars. Mm. And I, the first thing I thought of was, you know, tent caterpillars or some, you know, nasty caterpillar that we have here. And I ran to my cabinet and I grabbed a bottle of spray and I, you know, I was just about to go back outside and I thought, wait a minute, you don't know what that is. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, got out my books. I got out, you know, I went on the internet and I thought, this looks like an American lady. I'm not sure whether it was a painted lady or just, you know, the straight American lady butterfly, butterfly. caterpillar mm. there were hundreds of them mm -hmm. and it was you know nesting time and I, I they they disappeared quickly enough so I don't know how many you know survived but I thought well it's food for the birds you know and uh you know some some few weeks later all of a sudden I started to see American lady butterflies all over the yard so and the plant survived. I think that's the other thing people need to know. Uh, caterpillars can do a lot of damage to a plant, but if you're patient, the plant just grows new leaves. So that's my tip. <laughs> and that is a great tip because I know a lot of people are very trigger happy or quick to draw a, a bottle of bug spray on their gardens and uh it's a good idea to look back you know look into which what it is first to make sure it's not beneficial or food for which pretty much everything is food for other other animals or insects thank you so much lois for sharing that tip and for being on the garden nerd tip of the week podcast where can people find you online where can people find the library well, we try to be everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and the library website itself is a little complicated. So what I'm going to recommend is that people just put in their search bar, you know, right at the top of their browser, sustainablegardeninglibrary.org, all one word, and press enter on your search bar and it'll redirect you right to the website is that sustainable gardening library.org or sustainable garden library.org sustainable gardening got it yeah so okay sustainable gardening library.org and for your listeners who are interested uh right now we have a, a link where they can get 12 of my best tips for gardening sustainably anywhere when you first land on the home page, there's a photo of feature in our yard here. And if you go just below that, there's the link to download the 12 tips for gardening sustainably anywhere. We'll help people take advantage of that. Any social media presence you want to share? Facebook, Instagram, TikTok? Anyway, uh, we're we're not on TikTok. It's That's just fine. not my thing. But uh, yeah, Sustainable Gardening Library on Facebook. We're on Twitter, but I don't go on there that much. Uh, we do have our own YouTube channel. We've got a few tutorials there, and we actually have a video uh, introduction for middle school teachers, so fifth grade and up, with a lesson plan. The lesson plan is right in the description. And we're on Instagram as Sustainable Gardening Library. We're the only sustainable gardening library, hopefully for a while. Right? Okay, great. <laughs> All right, garden nerds, you'll find links to the Sustainable Gardening Institute and the library this week at gardennerd.com. We'll also share Lois's social media feeds and all the other good stuff she mentioned so that you can find out more about this incredible resource. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardennerd.com. Special thanks to True Leaf Market for sponsoring this episode. You'll find us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter under Garden Nerd One, on Facebook as gardennerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!